It's the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show is sponsored by Cheshire Impact on a mission to maximize your use of marketing automation and CRM. And today's guest, today's guest, wait until you hear her. I have this crazy, amazing, freaking cool guest. She's a storyteller. She's a conversational marketing leader, and we'll unpack that. She actually created a viral video, an actual viral video that went viral, not just you pretended it went viral. Uh, all these crazy things. Oh, one other thing you'll appreciate about this episode. She shares with me a complete intolerance for bullshit. So we're going to tell it like it is. Ladies and gentlemen, Sonia Jacob, welcome Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And no bullshit, okay? Like, no I don't bullshit. tolerate it. Let's not do the bullshit thing because I'm sick of it. Not allowed. Get out, bullshit. And not permitted. <laughs> I have to also say, you know, your, your resume continues. So all that amazingness about you. You're also the content strategy team lead at Drift. And Drift is just disrupting the game left and right. And is everywhere in content, in social and podcasts, everything. And they're actually executing faster than most companies. And there's particular yep. reasons they're doing that, which we're also going to get into. Um, but first, let's set this day up. We, we have themes for different months. And we had a, the idea is around a, a maturity model for marketing automation. Don't just go blast somebody with an email or just set up some new tool. You got you to gotta be going in the right steps. First things first, second things. We talked about knowing your audience. We talked about setting up reporting so you know what's working. And now we've gotten into the phase where we're talking about content marketing. We're talking about content and content marketing, knowing the game, gated content, not gated content. This is great time to drift as well. And you are a content maven. So that's the theme. And with that being said, there's a lot of BS out there and we love smashing yeah. it. So do you want to punch some bogus strategy in the face right now? Yeah, I, I definitely do. And, and thank you for the awesome introduction. Yeah. I think I want to take this opportunity to really just bust like a huge myth that I think has been around, you know, the duration of my, my career, but probably has heated up uh, in the last like five years. And that is the idea that content and that content machine is something that just sort of magically appears overnight. Um, yeah. I don't know if it is like a relic from, you know, the viral age, you know, that somehow you can write a single piece of content <laughs> and it's going to generate like hundreds of thousands of leads and, yes. and tons of traffic. But um, I think, you know, content strategists, content marketers everywhere um, would probably be in favor of smashing the myth that the content machine is built overnight. Or, you know, to just take it a step further, um, I would say the myth, uh, that you can just have one person doing content. Um, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest pet peeve, you know? Yeah. Um, and honestly, that's something that I think we're really working hard at Drift to, you know, obliterate. And that's basically the idea that it's just one person's job to create compelling content. In, in reality, that's, that's not possible. Everybody on the team has to be creating compelling content. I love that. Creating yeah. it and sharing it. One of the things that happens Absolutely. all the time. And I know you guys actually recently did something where you I, you basically blew up the internet. And it was it a blog post or a video, but or it's a launch, and then everyone just shared it yes. from Drift. What what was the story behind that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we did we did a, a minor takeover of the internet, I think yeah. is probably fair to say. Yeah, um, I like that. Basically, what we did was we had, you know, we had a really amazing launch um, for uh, Drift email for marketing. Yeah. Um, and we decided, you know, like, it's cool to, you know, use some of the same distribution strategies that we've used in the past. But one thing that we're really not into is like complacency, predictability. And so we're like, what if we just decided to talk about Drift email for marketing and let our, our people tell that story? Yeah. Um, and so what we did was um, we started making our own videos, you know, 30 second, one minute videos about uh, launch um, and sort of like what it did and how it was transforming the space. Um, and because, you know, we're pretty in lockstep at Drift, uh, we were able to get everyone sort of on the same page, recording their own videos, sharing it on LinkedIn. 
Um, and that's really where the magic happened right on LinkedIn. Um, mm, so, you know, yeah. people were sharing it, people were seeing it, anyone that they were connected to that was connected to Drift. Uh, so we were really able to share that message far and wide simply because we had so many individuals recording videos, sharing that message. Um, and it wow. was fantastic for us. Yeah. So do you have any kind of killer stats on that? Did, I mean, you blew it up, did the whole internet? It was one of our, yeah, it was, it was and, like one of our top traffic days, you know, ever. Wow. Um, and it was really all due to that, you know, organic effort. It was all on LinkedIn. You know, we didn't do, we didn't do anything outside of that. Um, and I think the, the secret there is really just getting everyone internally on the same page about, you know, what's so awesome about this particular launch. Uh, you know, for us, it was really that foray into like the conversational marketing platform. And so people were like, hell yes, let's just jump on LinkedIn and do something that any conversational marketer would do, which is record themselves and then post it up <laughs> on LinkedIn. You know, I think you're right. Uh, my first thought was, how do I get the logistics of getting my team to actually do the video? But before that is more important, which you said, which is yeah. getting everyone on the same page with the fact that this is actually important. Did right. you tell everyone this is important, go do a video? Or did you say this is important, go do something? Or how, how did you coordinate that in advance? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think we have a couple of secret weapons. I think, you know, the first secret weapon for us internally is that everyone is genuinely excited about what we have cool. uh, going out at any given point in time. And I'll tell you that, um, you know, having been at a lot of other companies where we've had product launches before and, and really not seen that same type of result, yeah. uh, the big difference with us is that our cadence is designed for the now, meaning that you know, our, our product team is kicking something off at the beginning of the week. And at the end of the week at show and tell, there's something to, to give the people. So we're all pretty in the loop. Um, and those show and tells that we have every week are kind of that touch point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, right before that was happening, you know, we didn't need to have any crazy internal distribution model for, you know, what people were going to share. We just knew that, you know, come Tuesday, we were going to get on LinkedIn. Everyone was going to record a video. Uh, we have like some amazing talent on the marketing team. Uh, my colleague, Sarah Pion, she's rad. Um, and she cool. really like herded the cats, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you but need at to. the end of the day, you, you don't need to give anyone a message. Uh, if your whole mantra is we are doing this for marketers, we are doing this for salespeople, you know, and this is why it's changing the game. So yeah. the beauty of it was like totally off the cuff. Um, and really the only element that, you know, you need is like, that you know now cadence that I was talking about, where everyone's on the same page about what's going out and why it matters. Yeah. Um, and then you know, shout out to Sarah, who's totally awesome. Yo, yo, um, shout out. Hey, Sarah. Um, <laughs> she's awesome. I mean, I hope she knows she's, she's awesome. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, she's well, she should amazing. now after listening to this podcast. Yeah, she's totally <laughs> amazing, and she just kept us on point all day. That's now. How many people are adrift right now? Oh God. I mean, that Roughly. number is, is constantly growing. Marketing I guesstimate. <laughs> yeah. I think we're over 120 right now. Right. I want to say we're over 120. Um, we, we had a few, uh, quite a few start recently. So it might even be a little bit higher. Um, people always ask, it might be worth knowing that the marketing team's uh, about 10 people. Oh, cool. Um, okay. Yeah. And so that's how we get stuff done. Uh, people are always asking, well, like, how is it that you guys are everywhere? You must have a yeah. huge marketing team. We have 10, um, but I think we are seeing grinders. Yeah. 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 Ten hard workers. We're just grinding. And I think the other thing is that, you know, we're all super passionate. So did you have 120 people making videos on LinkedIn on the same day, essentially? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Dan, yeah. Like not, not yeah. even just marketing, but sales, but sales will do no. sure, but yeah, IT and tech and everybody. coders and engineer mm. from engineers to, you know, front office to, you know, recruiters to marketers, to salespeople. Uh, you know, it was really like a whole family effort. Um, Did anyone and, get shy? I mean, because oh, there's different yeah, kind of yeah. personalities. I mean, you and I, we'll, we'll do a video. We're outgoing, you know. Four in the morning, yeah. We're busting <laughs> myths. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah. There's definitely shy people. But you know what? I think nobody should ever make it so that everybody sounds the same. It's the same deal with content, That's in my true. opinion. You've got to preserve that voice because voice is what differentiates us, right? And I think one of the things that we're passionate about at Drift is like allowing that voice to come out and just like making it, embedding it as part of like that total mosaic. And yeah. for sure, there were people who were incredibly shy, not used to doing videos. Uh, and but they, they were did it. Putting it out there. They did it. 
You know, that voice thing, I know we chatted a little bit about that previously. I think you should unpack that because there is a, and it's, this is directly tied into content, content marketing, yep. conversation. People oh. get really, it's like the Oxford Dictionary. It yeah. Down, you, and you know what? No one wants to read that stuff. No. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, the voice thing is huge. Um, and it, it's huge for me personally as a, as a content marketer, content yeah. strategist. Um, far too often what I see is people think they need to write a certain way for, say, a corporate blog or they need to sound proper or completely you know, polished. And I mean, obviously, no one's going out there and, and being um, inarticulate. Right. Uh, but I think there's this important uh, element that you need to incorporate into your writing, and that's that's your personality. Um, right. You really have to make sure that you're telling a story that's that you find relevant, you know, for your audience, but is also relevant for you. Um, and one of the things that we do at Drift that you know we double down on is you know using first person, you know, in blog posts, for example, like. I like that. If I want to write a blog post, I'm going to say I, you know, I mean, sure, there is a collective we, but it seems a little impersonal and, and certainly not very conversational to use we in a blog post. Um, you know, you're trying to bring people into that fold. Um, and so words and things like that matter quite a bit. And so yeah. um, the voice can come out if you just, you know, if you remove that we filter, you know, um, I, I see so many writers struggle with that where it's like, you know, I have to make this sound corporate and perfect and I have to use this collective we and it has to be, you know, beautiful and rosy. But in reality, the most compelling narratives are the ones that you believe are coming straight from the source, yeah. unfiltered, using the first person, right? So right. that's what we preserve at Drift. Um, it's also something that I'm super passionate about, just, you know, more broadly speaking. And, you know, I think that unvarnished thing is, is compelling, it's compelling for people. It also, it cuts through the noise. It's way easier or it's it feels more natural to trust a person than an entity. Right. I mean, politics so aside, companies, whether you like them or hate them, it's just when it's this gr this mob of people, but mm -hmm. when it's a Casey, a Sonia, a Sarah, whoever yeah. it is, a Jamie, right? All these different right. the name and this is what I believe in. And Hell yeah. I, you know, I remember just talking to people about marketing automation. They're like, I'm going to buy this because you sound like 100% convinced in your soul that this is going to help me. And yeah. I don't know, but I believe you, you know? Yeah. No, it's, it's totally true. And yeah. I think for, for us and for me, that's why, you know, you mentioned the whole conversational marketing leader bit. Yes. Um, relatively like new term. But I think what I'm trying to communicate with that is like, the things that we do that produce a lot of meaning happen one to one. Like you and I are having this conversation right now yeah. um, and we're connecting with each other on different topics and sort of like that viewpoint, I think carries over into so many different facets of content marketing, content strategy, um, talking to people like they are present right in front of you. And, mm. you know, we're, we're big fans of David Ogilvy at Drift, uh, but, you know, being, you know, a writer coming up, huge fan of David Ogilvy myself. Um, and he had this quote. Um, the quote was really just, you know, to paraphrase because I'm not going to do it justice, but yeah. uh, you don't want to talk to people using your writing as if the, you are talking to them from a stage, you know, and addressing a, a huge crowd. You want to talk to them like you're having a conversation. You want to be one-to-one. -one. Um, and that sort of sticks in the back yeah. of my mind all the time. The stage and I, you know, it's funny when you mentioned the third person, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on this. So I don't, I can't remember the last time I said we, uh, right. but when I think about the third person in writing, I think about people that talk about themselves in the third person and that is the rock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. also like the queen of England. Oh, sure. right? or, or, or monarchy. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. The, the Royal Highness is going to going to lunch right now or yeah. the rock thinks this and he's funny but it, it's only because it's funny but yeah it's a stage you're not with him they're presenting and it creates a separation right it like does. It's, a, it it's does. a barrier between you and i it does it doesn't really need to be there and what does that do that distracts us or we just we're not buying into the words we're not buying into the words i would say that without a doubt most people are just not buying into the sentiment you know like yeah if, if I'm coming to you with this barrier between us, you know, in marketing in general, uh, whether it's content or copy or any of those things, if you feel like there's a construct separating us, 
Mm -hmm. I've already failed as a marketer. You know, I've already failed as a salesperson too, because, you know, they're in a position where people are, you're going into it thinking like, I know you're going to sell me something, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. but if you're having, if you, if you walk away from those constructs and you start to sell like a human by having a conversation or market like a human by having a conversation that goes away um, and you instantly build rapport. Right. Right. That's cool. I, the conversational marketing, did you invent that or where did, where did that concept come did drift invent that where did where did that come from yeah um so i personally didn't invent it um but uh we definitely were the first folks to sort of create that category um and it's something i think the important distinction is like people have used the term conversational marketing before sure um but the turning point really is like when you can actually have conversations that scale into a marketing practice like when you can get to that point where you have the tools that allow you to do it, then it becomes a thing. Yeah. And that's really where, where Drift came in. Um, the idea of conversational marketing, I was even talking about this uh, like in my last blog post for Drift. Um, conversational marketing has been around, but now we have the tools to actually scale that out. Um, and so Drift has been pretty uh, pivotal in that way. Um, in you know, Not just saying like, hey, we've got this conversational marketing platform, but really that um, we are now making that available as like an ideology and a philosophy to people right. all over the place that they don't have to have this very rigid construct between themselves and their target audience. They can actually have conversations and do it in like a very uh, practical, sensible way. Right. Maybe you should even just share what Drift is for those who don't follow me on Twitter and get all oh, the retweets that I'm like, sharing. And <laughs> if you yeah. go, you should follow me and follow Sonia. <laughs> yes. Follow me, please. I'm Sonia on Twitter. Um, yeah, so Drift, uh, we're a conversational marketing and sales platform. Uh, we make it possible for you to connect with the visitors on your site on a one-to-one -one basis. So you can have conversations with someone, you know, a visitor who drops on there and wants to know more about your product, what you sell. Um, and then on the back end, we're doing a lot of things to facilitate that so that marketers and salespeople can collect the information that they need to collect about their prospects and um, mar only market to them when it's appropriate um, and where they want to be marketed to. So, so there's email too now with that? Yeah. So we oh, had cool. back in January, we did, um, we launched our, our sales sequences uh, to that product. Um, but now we have drift email for marketing. Um, oh which makes it possible. Yeah, I know. Watch out marketing finally, automation. Drift is on here, the way. Here. Watch out HubSpot. <laughs> yeah, I know. Seriously. Oh man. It's just, it's real, it's on, but I think the underlying goal is really to make it more human, uh, right. which sounds strange because you're talking about technology, but at the same time, this is how people buy today. Right. Um, you know, they want that one-to-one -one and they want to circumvent, you know, those typical BS, B2B, you know, processes, which right. everyone hates, but they keep doing. You know, in, when I first experienced just early on with Drift, what, what's mm -hmm. neat about it, it kind of, we're talking about disruption. It disrupts the whole idea of chat on your website. Yes. That I, I did a long time ago when we were selling software. And the only cool right. thing about it was after you chatted with someone, if they bought, you got a little cha-ching sound afterward to let you know it worked. It's the it's, only thing. Yeah, it was more of an e-commerce, but, 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 some people do want to chat. Some people don't want to chat. But I, I also like there's a lot of things built into it. Um, and hey, this show should be sponsored by Drift. But there's yeah. a lot of things built Never into know it. Never know what Right. Uh, saying, with, oh, it's almost like AI, right? Is, yeah. is there like yeah. a real movement to that? Because I remember you first chat with the Drift bot, but then it responds to what you're saying. And if you say, I want to talk to a human, it goes, cool. Let me go get John over here who's in sales. He's online right now. Exactly. Here's John. Yeah. You know, but if right. they don't, if they just it answers the questions they have for mm -hmm. them and it learns from it. And to your point, it puts them in different segments. And, and now you can email from it. Yeah. Oh man, I mean, adding the email is huge because that. It was that, big. Yeah. Now the now there's less there's more overlap and there's different choices to make here. So yeah, there's I think it's really the simplest way to put it is that we make it possible to reach out to your visitors, to your prospects in exactly the way that they interact with your brand, sure. you know? Um, so sometimes they're going to open an email um, and they're going to engage with you that way. Um, but sometimes they're going to get an email from you and they're not going to respond to it. They're going to go instead to your website. So with Drift, it's smart enough to distinguish those things and say like, Oh, I see that I sent you this email, but you prefer to chat on, on our website. So let's do that right. here, but I'm going to be smart about it. 
Right. So yeah, AI is, is helping us become better, you know, marketers, become better sellers. Um, and that's really what it's all about. That's cool. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I just sort of geek out about it. And it, it's great that you have this disruptive product. Just everyone's like, why don't you just know your place in the MarTech place here? And right. nope, nope. Just tear it up. Just throw everything out. We're blowing yeah. it up. Poor Silver Pop is like, but aren't we still emailing people? It's like, Silver Pop, please. <laughs> Just everyone, let's take a moment and appreciate. Yeah, yeah. let's start um, innovating here, people. Oh, you know what? what Gary, v, Gary V had a video I saw today on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, talk, and he just swears more than I do. That's probably the difference. He has more hair. Uh, awesome, I guess. I don't it know. was like, why did Toys R Us go out of business? Mm -hmm. and he was saying, uh, well, two things. One, they let, back in the early 2000s, they let Amazon do their fulfillment, their shipping fulfillment. Oh. And then people got super used to buying toys on Amazon. <laughs> it was, Hell yeah. what are you doing? And, Hell and, yeah. and secondarily, they didn't innovate. And he rattled off a couple things. And I was yeah. like, that would be cool. He's a, they could have had like the national Lego building competition. They could have had a slime center where you oh, yeah. slime. They could have made those stores instead of just being big box stores. They could be these interactive like fun zones where you yeah. buy overpriced toys and take them home. But they didn't. Right. Now they're no. out of business. So, yeah. yeah. That's so true. I think, you know, the other big thing that <clears throat> what that really talks to is like this idea of like supply versus demand. I mean, we're moving into this new phase where mm. it doesn't matter if you've got the supply, like it doesn't matter that Toys R Us has all these toys because people can go anywhere to find this now. Um, and that's why obviously, you know, shopping on Amazon is, you know, a Toys R Us killer. It's a killer of a lot of different businesses Yeah, because they, it's not like, it's not just the supply, but like they're owning that demand as well. People want to buy what they want to buy and get it immediately. And that's huge. Yeah. And, and just video games, just, continuing to be cooler and cooler and eventually yep. we are and all that. So yeah, crazy, 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 you know, and even just to take you back a little bit too, when we were talking yeah. about building the content machine, right. Smash, it's not an overnight success. No. And sometimes it's the, the new marketer getting into it that thinks that it's that, but sometimes it's the, it's the person, their boss or, mm -hmm. you know, you have to set expectations about what that process right. looks like, how long that takes. And I was just thinking about a gym, you know, you, mm -hmm. you could go to the gym for eight hours today, but that's not going to make you yes. stronger or more fit. It's a, it's a, it's Hell a yeah. discipline. So just like there's a, there's a discipline in reporting, there's a discipline in, in content creation and content marketing. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. So how, how, how do you infuse the team with that discipline or is it just part of the makeup? Or how, how do you keep that tempo as, as yeah. it's? No, that's an important question. I think, I think you know, it, this is kind of piggybacking on the myth busting element, but um, yeah, bust it. definitely totally. been, we're going to bust it. Um, so I think like essentially people have become so obsessed with metrics and outcomes mm. to the point that they're relatively meaningless. So, we marketers have created this ecosystem of metrics where, you know, you, you're doing all these amazing things, right? And you're, you're driving traffic, you know, you've got some, you got some SEM campaigns going, you're retargeting people, you know, you have, uh, hopefully you don't have a form on your site, but some people still do. Um, <laughs> you're doing all of these different things, right? And I think what happens is like, we're chasing so many different outcomes that we really don't know what's dry, what's moving the needle and we really don't know how to communicate what we're doing to the rest of the organization. Yeah. So like there's lots of different ways you can, you know, slice and dice that, but I think it's really really important to identify what you're trying to do with content at any given point in time, right? So, you know, you might be at a stage in your company where you have no content um and you're like I would really like to be doing content. Right. So if you, if you set out to do that, awesome. Like that's super exciting. But you have to say like, okay, content is going to do this for us now. For example, if you want to build an audience, you want to drive traffic to your site, start creating content on a regular basis, write about the things people find compelling. And honestly, like nine times out of 10, what people get confused about is what content can do to drive a particular outcome at a particular point in time. So if you're working on top of the funnel content, you know, and you're trying to raise awareness and drive traffic to your site, Chances are, if you've got a tiny team, you're not also doing middle of the funnel content mm. to try and engage people that you've already sort of had that initial you know, touch with. 
So I think people have to be realistic. And I think leaders, marketing leaders and business leaders in general have to be realistic about what content you do at a given point in time to drive those business outcomes. Um, and I think to stay motivated, you were, you were talking a little bit about like, how do you keep up that tempo? Well, I think it's complicated only in the sense that you, you have to be doing a lot of, um, you have to be doing a lot of working with your team to make sure everybody is on the same page. But I think you have to sort of set up a cadence, right? One of the big things that we do at Drift is we have like these weekly cadences. Um, and I, you know, we've definitely, I've seen this at other companies. You have the two week sprint, whatever that is, whatever you want to call it. Sure. You have to find an interval of time um, where you, you say, this is what I'm going to do. And, and here's when we're going to complete it and share it with the company. Um, mm -hmm. So we stay focused really by keeping that weekly tempo, having a cadence around um, those you know week long intervals, and pushing things out there on a regular basis. Um, I think that, that really helps us. Just the content side of your team, or the whole marketing team, or the whole company. Whole marketing How's team and the whole company. Okay. Yeah, whole marketing team, weekly whole company. Tempo. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, some people work on two week sprints, and that's awesome for them. Um, for yeah, the content, good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's like great. What really, whatever works for you. It's not a yeah. one size fits all situation. But um, you know, for us, uh, it's really all about you know, you kick off the week on Monday. You have something for show and tell on Friday to share. You know, with the entire group. Cool. Um, and then everyone gets on the same page. Um, not just the content people, but the business leaders, the marketing leaders, they know what's up and people are contributing. So do you meet within the marketing team on week to the show and tell? Cause I hunt show and tell for 120 people might take all day, but is it each individual group is doing a show and tell or how does that work? Precisely. Yeah. So we, you know, at Drift, we're really into communication. <laughs> so we over communicate yeah. about yeah. everything because that's how you make stuff work. And it's also the core of what we do, right? You know, we talk to visitors, you know, we have a tool that helps people talk to visitors on their site, but internally we have that same regular like interaction that allows us to communicate quickly. And so as a team, we are meeting, you know, internally on a weekly basis to share what's going on. You know, we have nine people, those nine people have to stay, yep. you know, in touch with one another. We're on Slack, you know, jumping in, uh, you know, sharing what we're working on. Like we have that level of transparency. Um, and then, you know, on Fridays when we do have show and tell when we share those things, um, each team sort of has like a, you know, a representative who's sharing what has happened. Um, it's, it's hugely important for us. Uh, it's hugely important to let people know what we're working on and how it's moving the needle. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's the most aligned group of people that I've ever worked with. Um, and it's honestly radically different from anything else. Yeah, that's that's really you were sharing earlier that I mean this is this is all really good details because this is specifics like this yeah. is what we do, and obviously you know bend it mold it to your own organization or your own exactly team. and if you have a team of two people have a weekly tempo. Oh um, yeah, but this gets into the topic. A lot of people have been saying that that you guys you know product aside, you just execute. Yeah. really quickly and yeah, done. thing of big companies don't execute very quickly they're very slow to move mm -hmm. and little companies do execute and but getting up to 120 you know there's a lot of things going on but you're still keeping that tempo up so how, what would you attribute that to yeah that's an excellent question i mean i think there are definitely companies that you know are large and they still execute they get stuff done um yeah. i think you're you know when you're early stage and, and you have, you know, a specific objective, you know, certain actions, a certain cadence is, is warranted. Um, and same thing when you're a large company. But I like to think that, you know, in order to stay relevant right now, both as a brand, uh, but then also as like a content creator, as a content strategist, you need to be out there. Um, and I, I would say that in our you know, desire to connect with people, we want to be out there. So that means that, you know, blog posts don't come out once every three weeks. I mean, there's definitely people who are crushing it with super long form content. Uh, shout out to my girl, Amelia at Mixed Panel because, yo, yo. Uh, she, yeah, she, you know, she's one of, uh, you know, my, um, you know, sort of people in my network who has crushed it with that, you know, um, cool. you work on some longer form pieces, you get that compounding return. I think that's great you have to see what works for your brand. For us, what works really, really well is being, you know, on top of what's happening in the marketing and sales spaces um, and reaching out to people on a regular basis to talk about what they're talking about in their respective circles. Um, and I attribute that sort of thing to having something to prove, 
Yeah. Um, you know, is it short of form? Not as long form as Amelia or how do you approach yeah, it? How's your audience like it? Right. So I think what we like to do, and, and this is probably true of everywhere that I've worked, uh, you just like to test things out. You have yeah. to see what's working. Um, I think if you're trying to do what I call a, a 10x piece of content, um, mm. and really all that means is, so a 10x piece of content for me is like a piece of content that you work on that is in some way a cornerstone of your brand and, oh, and your right. philosophy. So, you know, you might, for example, we had conversational marketing week last week. So we put out, you know, a 4,000 word post about how to actually execute conversational marketing. Cool. And so there were seven, yeah, there were seven plays in there for people who, you know, are curious about getting started with it. Um, and so I really think that, you know, depending on what your, you know, desired outcome is, you, you sort of swap out the types of content in different lengths uh, as needed. I think you quite frankly need both. Um, you know, I think if you're going to be a thought leader and you want people to understand where you're coming from, you need to have the 10 X pieces of content at least once per quarter. Yeah. Um, and then be working on, I would say, you know, typical blog posts, 1700, 2000 words, something of that nature. Uh, people do more without a doubt. Um, you know, longer posts are great for compounding returns, like in terms of search. Yeah. Um, but you should be doing a little bit of everything. Interesting. You know, we were chatting with Andy Crestodina the other day and he surveyed thousands of bloggers and writers and mm -hmm. the length is, is increasing a bit. So yeah, we're it definitely is. it's about, it's about 2000 is the average now, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you're talking about. But, but I like yeah. to be mixing it up too, but the cornerstone piece, the cornerstone content, yeah. NX content, that makes a lot of sense. What, yep. What's key for you, for us, it's the marketing automation maturity model. So mm -hmm. cornerstone piece, here's it. Here's how you, you know, all that, what you're talking about and then maybe yep. the support it afterward, uh, yep. or support the concepts, other ideas, but mixing it up, but having those cornerstone pieces, planning on that for once a quarter, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's a practical way for people to think about their content, right? Because yeah. content can mean so many different things to different people. Um, and you're, you're pulled quite frankly in a lot of different directions, but with 10x content, you know, you can you can feed a lot of different people in your organization for a very long period of time. And I'll just give you a quick example. Like we put out that, you know, 4,000 word piece that I told you about, seven different plays. You know, you mm -hmm. work on a piece like that, it's worth your time because afterwards you can take those individual plays and right. you can you can, you know, expound on that. Yeah. Like play number five and write a blog post about it. Yeah. You know, better yet, feed your sales team. I had one member of our, our sales team the other day say like, that post was super helpful. And the reason why is because I can actually go and share it with someone that I'm yeah. talking to, like a prospect. But I don't just share, you know, like one single, hey, check out this, you know, this blog post. I can go play by play and even right. establish like a cadence of emails around sharing those plays and sharing insights and creating that relationship with someone. That's cool. That's cool. Did that, that 10 X, did you invent that or did it come from like the, the 10 X book? I don't know if you've seen that. There's a book 10 X too. And I, you know, I've, I've picked it up somewhere in the last few years and it's just something I've used to Stuff. describe yeah. 10 X content because basically what it comes down to is like everybody needs to produce a few of those. Um, yeah. You can see your, you know, your demand gen efforts. You can have, you know, that fresh content by, you know, investing in, in your own data set, I think one of the things I've, I've done in the past is really to take the data that's, that's present, you know, uh, through your product mm -hmm. um, and use that to, you know, sort of tell a tale uh, to highlight some really interesting ways that people are, you know, practicing things. Um, you know, how many emails do they send? What kind of content do they send? Um, I think all of those things are really compelling. Mm. And you, you mentioned tell a tale, which re reminds me about the whole mm -hmm. concept of storytelling is Yes, right now, and you're it's a storyteller. Huge. We're sitting around it's the campfire huge. here, swapping stories as well. But mm -hmm. it sounds like we're increasing the length of blog posts, but we're also hopefully making the shift to being more of a storyteller, less of a robot cranking right. out a white paper. Yeah, absolutely. I think storytelling has been huge, and I think it's both a good and a bad thing, right? Okay. Um, you know, like I don't mind being called a storyteller because I think there's something grateful and appreciative about, you know, people saying, oh, you're a storyteller. I think that's great. I mean, let's face it, stories have sort of encapsulated all of these lessons over time, right? Mm. 
you know, people tell, uh, you know, important like historical lessons and, and just cultural beliefs. They share those through stories and businesses kind of do the same thing. You know, they right. share their philosophy uh, and what really matters to them through stories. Um, but I think it's really, really important that we really own up to being storytellers instead of kind of, you know, as I like to say, half-assing it. Okay. You want to be, be whole-assing yeah. your stories. Totally. Um, and I think the simplest way to put that is, you know, you have to commit to the idea that you are having that conversation, you're using first person, you're hooking people with a narrative that they care about, not simply something that's just like regurgitated info or parroted content that you've seen anywhere, kind of like, don't get me wrong. I love tips posts. Mm -hmm. They're great. They're awesome. But if your whole content strategy is five tips for this, top <laughs> 10 that, and you know, yeah. ultimate lip listicles, you're probably not going to engender the type of relationship with your prospects uh, that you would if you just told a story. Yeah, that's, you, you know what? We learn more from stories and I'm in yes. a, a particular CEO group where they forbid us from giving each other advice because Ooh. How are we going to actually know anything about your situation in two right. minutes of you telling us a story? But hearing your story, I probably experienced something similar. So instead mm -hmm. of telling you what to do, I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you what I did and what happened. And right. then you, ideally you get a bunch of these stories, can just draw mm -hmm. your own conclusions from that. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. Story, we remember the stories. I won't remember yeah. you did all these nine actions, but I remember the fact that you went and flew there and dude did this and it paid off. Yeah. You know, and I'm just, Absolutely. I'll, I'll remember that forever and I'll, it'll come up the next time it happens. So stories are, are important, but to your point, actually do them. So you mentioned yeah. a few things. To actually be doing it justice, what, what are the things we need to keep at the forefront? Yeah, so I think to, to be a real storyteller and to, to make that impact, uh, or really to harness the power of story, yeah. you have to figure out like what's your, your greater narrative here. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the easiest way to do that um, is to think about sort of a real life scenario where you experienced some aspect of the story you're trying to tell. So I usually open blog posts with like a personal reference. Um, and it drifts since we're super huge fans of first person. Um, that makes it 10 times easier, right? right. Um, so if I share with people, for example, you know, that just the other day, you know, I took my phone because I have my phone all the time, um, you know, and I called like a lift, right, to come pick yeah. me up. Sure. And it was super easy because I all I had to do was open my open my lift app, get my car done. I could go to the restaurant where I booked my reservation the night before, also on my phone. And it was great. Um, and that really showed me like how like reliant I am on messaging businesses and things of that nature, yeah. right? So when I write a post about messaging and businesses and why it's compelling, I'm going to tell that story that I just told you, you know, oh. I'm going to say like, here's how I live my life. Here's how a reasonable number of other humans are living their lives <laughs> right. as evidenced by, I think it's crucial. Like, yes, you can use your own anecdotes and your own opinion, but you've got to yeah. back that up with, with data. And so as a storyteller, what I like to do is hook people with that narrative in the beginning and then obviously go out there and find the research that supports that, that narrative. So, you know, I'll pull in, uh, you know, a survey of 6,000 people about how they like to message brands to say like, Hey, like my narrative is actually not unique. Everybody, lots of people, all these people in this survey said the same thing that I said. Um, and I think those are two practical ways that you can start to use stories strategically. Right. Um, and how to incorporate data alongside like a really compelling human narrative. You know, it's interesting. I think the, the best, the best content we write, we do that. Like, and mm -hmm. I've done this accidentally, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe yeah. subconsciously. I just right. put a post on LinkedIn like two days ago. I didn't, the, the company definitely all shared it, but they didn't make their own videos. Uh, yeah. About yeah. the seven buyer motivations from one of our previous podcasts. It's fascinating. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, we, and we started with a story. For some reason, it felt compelling to me. And now I realize that's right. It, it yeah. is. It was about uh, someone on our team, uh, Jesse. He was at a mm -hmm. car dealership and shared the story how they take your keys mm -hmm. because they're going to go check your car out to make sure it's a trade-in, but they don't really right. give them back. So you're mm -hmm. stuck there and, and buyer's yeah. fatigue kicks in. So that whole story, I mean, I even remember that now, right? It's that, that story was like, wow. And I, and I shared at the beginning of the blog post and that, that makes a lot of sense. So hook people with 
get, you know, hooked with a personal story. And also that sounds yeah. like a TED talk too, you know, like yeah. very quick, you know, one of them was uh, someone was on a, a plane. A, maybe it was the plane that landed in the Charles or not the Charles. Oh, Hudson. that's a river. Yeah. And he mm-hmm. like, the plane was going down and I learned three things about my life. <laughs> we're like, we're like, exactly. What three things did you learn? It was amazing. So, okay, yeah. cool. Hook him with that. Uh, what else would you recommend then? We, we hook him I with mean, a personal story. Hook him with a personal with story. Data use data to back it up. Yeah. Provide, you know, provide context whenever possible. I think that's like a huge mm-hmm. piece, like maybe even an overarching one because context changes everything. If, if you're telling people, um, you know, that in this specific situation, I face this challenge as a marketer. Um, that's so much more compelling than force feeding a bunch of features uh, down someone's throat and saying like, do this and here's this feature uh, and you should use this right now. Instead, you have to create that context for why something would be useful. So, right. so you know, this works really well for product posts, things okay. of that nature. Don't boss them into it. Don't boss them. Never yeah. boss them. Never Give them the context. You yeah, know? there's another quote like people don't want to be sold, right? Yeah. You know? nope. So, so when you mentioned context, I I think I know what that word means, right? We all know what yeah. that word actually means, but in the terms of writing, we're saying don't push them around. Instead, are you saying tell them? It's almost like another personal anecdote Give or an example. Yeah. Give yeah, them an example. example. Like, I mean, as a marketer writing for marketers, uh, one of the things that's it's incredibly fun, powerful. Just- <laughs> super it's fun. fun it's 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 also like it's also one of the hardest jobs because yeah. they don't buy the bullshit you know that right. you, can't stop, you can't sell them the bullshit and right. i think obviously <laughs> i don't want to sell them the bullshit but the point is that we have such a discerning audience as marketers marketing to marketers that right. you know you, you can't play that game right. um and i think that's where context comes in because you can actually say like here's a situation where I thought I was screwed. You know, I, I put up this, this landing page, you know, I made all of this content. Nobody was, you know, nobody was visiting it. But then I realized I hadn't distributed it to anyone. I hadn't shared it. I hadn't promoted it in any way. So by actually sharing the context in which you hit these problems as a marketer, it yeah. becomes a lot more compelling and, and a lot more relevant to, to readers. I think that helps you avoid those common phrases too. Mm-hmm. Fact, uh, fact finding, um, oh, customer God. centric, goal oriented. Print you all. I don't even know what they are because I, I just the jargon. Them from the jargon words. The yeah, the jargon's tough. You know, cutting they, edge, latest right. cloud technology. Is, <laughs> you know, the cloud one hundred. Um, yeah, I think it's okay to maybe use those words when you're talking to a marketer one to one and it's in a casual setting where you're like. I'm just going to throw this jargon around because I know you know what I'm talking about. But yeah. in reality, it's like if you use those words in your writing, it makes for like a super unpleasant reading experience for your reader. And um, I never want to provide that. Um, you know, I want people to feel like when they read something that it's not filled with all of these grandiose terms, but yeah. really just, you know, language that makes sense to them. And you know, I'll tell you this because I think people need to be real and be real with themselves about their writing. It doesn't come easy. You know, we all go to school and we are told you have to write your essay this way. You know, right. if you spent a little time in academia, it's even worse. And then you <laughs> yeah. go in and you're, you're writing something. Yeah, you get brainwashed and you're like, I'm pontificating on the roots of the, you know, it's like nobody wants to read that. So you have to break, you have to actively break yourself of those habits. Um, and that's where, so like I'm a huge fan of editing um, and that mm. sounds strange, but you have to self edit. Um, and people have so many challenges with this where they, you know, they, they pound something out with the content and then they don't really like look at it once or twice after that, they just hit publish. And the editing part is the way that you get to that beautiful finished piece. Mm, you have to true. at least, at least true. once read it out loud. If you can't like, Here's what I tell people. If you write an email or if you write a blog post and you read it, and if it's difficult to read out loud, ain't nobody going to want to read it. <laughs> like, <laughs> read it after that. you know what I mean? Like that is not the way to do it. So you have right. to optimize for the conversation. Really. You have to optimize for getting that message across as efficiently as possible and as real as possible. Um, otherwise, you know, all this content falls flat. 
you know what it I, a lot of us especially you know it's almost like the more we fall into the creative side we want to just paint our picture mm-hmm. and, but you know what even van gogh edited mm-hmm. and oh, sure. painted a thousand practices and and actually you know what there's um there's I, this painting where there's like it's like a park in france Mm-hmm. Sunday Sunday afternoon in the park. It's like it's, that's the pointillism one. The it's pointillist, like, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I was watching. I think it was on that show. Um, uh, like it's like stolen art or something like that. Um, okay, like mysteries of artwork and where he had actually done a study on that same mm-hmm. park, smaller piece, same view, just no people in it, mm-hmm. and it was the same river and trees and everything. Yeah. And then eventually he did that, liked it, liked how it looked, added people to the next one. Right. You yep. got to You got to self edit it. Mm-hmm. And as painful as it might be, getting a little bit of that discipline. And I think as you do more of it, you can kind of build it up like a muscle. Because I know when I that I was talking about, I didn't want to, but I did. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad I did because you know, as artists, we want our best foot forward. And I had just some some things there and there, like they instead of the. Which right. would read like really bad, and you just need to need to read it. You know, I did it once, yeah. and and I wanted to get it out there. But I, mm-hmm. there's probably value in that second time, to your point, because I, I feel like you were yeah. not only going over, okay, what sounds stupid the first time, but then the second mm-hmm. time, is there any better way I could say this, or yep. you know, am I rambling? Could I condense right. this? Something yeah, can like you can you create like I think. One of the things that I've always been like nerdy about with writing is, you know, you can use lots of different devices to make your, your, your copy or your content sound more conversational and, and have that potential to connect better. Um, And you just need to know when to employ them, you know, like in school, they tell you repetition is bad. You've used the same word too many times in that paragraph, but in advertising, in, you know, copywriting, Sometimes repetition is good. Mm. You know, you have to like sort of train your brain to figure out when to use certain things artfully and strategically. Um, And that's why I think it's, you know, writing is part art, part science. Um, The art part is, you know, that narrative. um, But the science part is the methodology. You know, you are, you want to tell this tale, right? But, you know, sometimes when you're telling a tale, it's not cogent. People don't know what you're saying. It's all over. <laughs> Guilty. And, yeah. I mean, it, but you know what? I've done this many a time. And you, the way that you fix that is through the science, through the methodology. Um, and that's, I think, something that a lot of content people need to know, like if they're just starting out, that, you know, you really do need both pieces of the puzzle there totally. in order to make that great content, that high quality content. Totally. And, and- yeah, guilt. You mentioned that. I just, I, I, uh, I went to the Super Bowl this year. And nice. I just, I was like, I want to go. I bucket list. Make sure, just go. Yeah. Results not so much for New England, but I was yeah. there and I saw. Right. And uh, later on, a week after, I, I did a Facebook live share, mm-hmm. and I wrote down a whole list. But I just shared everything about my whole. If you and then my wife was sharing. It's a little. It's a little much. Like I, I tend to oh, and then I did this and right. some mixed drinks over here. So yeah, yeah. a little bit of that editing, obviously the raining it in. That. Yeah, raining it in mm-hmm. can can really help communicate the point as much yep. as just going crazy with it. Right, and you know, like you and me, when we read a blog post, we read an article, whatever. There's only so much we can take in, right? Sure. You know, you know, two or three points maybe. Um, maybe if you really want to make it impactful, it's really just one thing that you're trying to share with someone, but people's attention spans are significantly shorter. Absolutely. But I think that people do appreciate and, and, uh, share higher quality content. That's like tightly focused and around a three, a few key lessons about whatever you're sharing. Right. Yeah. The right story, the right, uh, I got, was it, I think it was, you were saying earlier that really disruption comes from the story. If you mm-hmm. have the right story, then it, it really, what I, what I heard from you too is Drift figured out its why. Mm-hmm. And if they know who mm-hmm. the who is, 
So now yeah. they're going on and crushing. I was chatting with uh, Asia Matos uh, mm-hmm. earlier, and she was those just the two questions. If you can nail yeah. those, she tried to help uh, you know growth startups and just you know one or two tech founders. She asked them those questions, and that just opens up the world to us as content marketers and Absolutely. conversational marketers. Understanding yeah. why are you doing this and who are you doing this for? Absolutely, and you know conversation then is that is that method that's a device for you to connect with people and right. um i i was actually talking to john barrows i was interviewing him for a, a blog post yeah and sales right he, yeah we'll get him on he, here on sales yeah is he's awesome now, but we'll do yeah we'll definitely have him on he is awesome and he's had this you know amazing trajectory and amazing in the sense that it has been anything but traditional um but he's had you know incredible success and i think you know his, you know, one of the big takeaways from that conversation for me was that he was like really teaching people to believe, believe in what they were selling yeah, uh, and be able to, you know, be able to talk about that. Why, you know, why right. you're selling X, Y, or Z. Is it the, the greatest product on earth? No, but for the right group of people, for the right target audience, it does amazing things. And yeah. I think that kind of distinction about the who and the why, um, I think that's why it's so compelling. Um, you know, you, you need to figure out who you're talking to um, and what their lives are like that, you know, they consider your product and think, okay, yeah, that would actually solve my problem. Totally. And, you know, it reminds me of that, that uh, McLeod, Lisa Earl McLeod book, Noble Purpose. The mm-hmm. sales reps that, uh, that genuinely want to help people out sell more. It just, it, yeah. it's just a fact. Yes. And, and as marketers, same thing. And if you're okay. having an issue caring about your your prospects, you should meet mm-hmm. some, have some drinks, yep. have some lunch. Maybe you'll like them. If you still don't like them, leave and go to a different company because you're not going to be yeah. happy. You're not going to do good work if you don't really want to help the people out. Exactly. You have to have that authentic connection. Otherwise, you run into all sorts of problems. And honestly, you know, he actually pointed out something else that was super compelling to me. And that, you know, is the idea that you really can't, you don't want to be that person who can sell anyone, anything. You don't want to be that steamroller. Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately that means that you're not listening to what people are saying and what they need. You know, Um, you have to be able to create the opportunities to listen to your prospects through both your marketing and your sales. Right. Um, You know, if you, are a marketer who thinks that your prospects and the people who are going to pay for your product think one way, go out and test it. Talk to people. Definitely. You know, it can't be this, you know, ivory tower, for lack of a better term, situation where you think that your target audience wants one thing, but in reality, that's not what they need at all. Totally. And you, you may find there's so many stories around that. You actually talk to them, actually have a human conversation with them and find out Told something totally different, and yeah. um, who we were talking with uh, Adele Ravella, and she mentioned mm-hmm. you know, John Deere, mm-hmm. multiple geos, multiple industries, multiple this. They had two buyer personas. That was it. Yep. They had, yeah, they had the the experienced guy who has bought hundreds of these things, and mm-hmm. he wants to see a chart, and he does not want to talk to someone. And then there's yep. this other person who's never done it before, and they really wants to talk to someone. And, yeah, and being able to serve them and give them the data and the details they want. Uh, made such a difference just yeah and the, right the talking just talk yeah. to someone piece and that actually brings up another um i think sort of a helpful viewpoint i see a lot of people uh content people obsess over personas and then mm. what you usually have is like a business leader who comes in and says but like what about this persona like let's let's differentiate between personas um and potential new markets um, cool yeah you know, bring like it down yeah, we need to like, let's think about like, what's an opportunity that we might want to evaluate, um, you know, in the future, but who are we creating content for right now? Right now, um, yeah. And that's that's really, really key. Um, and also like a big stumbling block is around the idea that, you know, well, how do we write for all these different people that we, you know, sell to when they have different titles and they do slightly different things? Sure. Chances are, I mean, and this is like, this was a huge epiphany for me. It's okay. like, chances are they all have, you know, similar and fewer problems. So you want to write content that talks about the problems. You don't want to write content that's, you know, and then the director of demand generation did X, Y, or Z, or what does the director, let's 
it's far too specific. When in reality, you know, your product is probably solving two, three, maybe four problems. Generally speaking, I would say probably that's too many. Talk about the problems and how, you know, you can solve them. Um, you know, if you're doing product content, yes, you can be explicit about that. But if you're not doing product content and you're doing thought leadership content, you can still talk about the experience of, of those problems. If, you know, if your audience is CFOs, um, you don't want to go in and, and be really prescriptive about what CFOs should really be doing. You want to talk right. about the problems that they're facing and, and what sort of pushes them to go look for a solution. Talk about the problems. And don't be that oh, yeah. guy that sells or gal that sells everything to everyone. Do not be that guy or gal. Like, I will <laughs> don't personally find that. you. I will personally find you and we'll have a talk. Jeez. So where did all this amazing content lightning bolts come from with you? Like, what's, what's the story? I know you, you were almost going to go into the – you're going to be almost be, get your PhD. I mean, just give us a little background I know, on – the, the Sonia, the Ad Sonia. The Sonia. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the Ad Sonia is, yeah, I, when I was, when I was coming up, um, I right. really thought, you know, <laughs> I, I love people. I love like phenomenology and trends and all of that. Totally. Um, and so, you know, I thought my niche was really like, oh, well, I'll go be like a professor of sociology or, or something like that. But really, you know, in going to grad school and, and getting into that sort of uh, group, I realized that you know, for me, it was much more exciting to be a practitioner than a theorist. Um, yeah. And so marketing, like getting into marketing really gave me that opportunity to still, you know, look at phenomenology and trends, um, but do that through, you know, this kind of practitioner lens, writing, uh, creating, doing, making things. And so yeah. that was really like, for me, that was the journey. Um, I had to go and sort of experiment and see if uh, it felt right. Um, but then I eventually found, you know, my, my sort of niche in writing and in content. Yeah. It's really interesting to think about sociology and yeah. it's almost like the theory of what we're doing in marketing. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's the underpinning, you it's know, the underpinning. It's, it's, yeah. it's trends. It's, it's all of those things that influence as, as people, as groups, as cultures. Um, and you can take that and you can turn that into compelling marketing. Um, and you can use that like sociological lens to examine marketing trends. Yeah. Like how would you do that? Um, I think the easiest way to do that is by being observant. You know, if you start to see, you know, themes and problems pop up over and over again, I think you can train your eye and have that lens to say like, okay, this is appearing over and over again, this problem maybe we should build a product for that. Maybe as a marketer, I should write about that. Wow. Um, and I think that that's really, really interesting. Um, and obviously, as a sociologist, you want to make sure that, you know, if you're talking about a big old trend, you want to make sure that, you know, more than a few people are experiencing this, that there's some significance. Um, that goes for product too. You know, you want to make sure that if someone's having or experiencing a problem, um, that there's some meat to it and that it's actually a, some, a problem that they're suffering from. Um, so I think that content kind of like fills that same void there. You can actually use phenomenons and trends to really hook into a, a variety of broader narratives. You know, this is fascinating. I, I, I could almost, I don't know, if you, you don't have time to write a book, maybe you do, but the idea of sociology infused into marketing Hell yeah. You know, like, because I'm fascinated. Now I'm just like, I need to go find a, or maybe audit a, a local course on it or, you know, online course. Just because I, because I can immediately see the strings and to your point, it's the theories, but someone like you or myself, we want to see results. We want to see our own impact on the world. Did we, did we affect this change? And right. so move over to the application side and that's marketing is that we're, we're applying, we're observing. Oh, yeah. that, it sounds like you really learned a lot about observing people and the, and the yes. act of observing so that you're, you're conscious, not just of the surface level of what's happening, but what is really happening. And then drawing the comparisons into marketing. Now you're just, uh, you're testing and, and applying yeah. and seeing if you're right. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. You can, you can start with the macro and, yeah. and get into the micro too. Like, I think that's really what it's all about. Um, and, you know, my job really, you know, as a writer, as a content strategist, is to be cognizant of those macro trends and what happens, you know, when you go deeper. How does that manifest itself in how you do your job, uh, your performance, how you're evaluated? Um, I think that's what fascinates me. So I, I, I buy into that. 
um, I, I, I would make the same journey if you plop me into a sociology class. I, Hell yeah. I, you're, you know what? I'm, I'm sure you were annoying to some professors who you want to start applying this and testing this out. And like, no, no, we're just going to observe. Like, but I want to see if I can affect change on this person and, and yeah. uh, make, make the other choice next time. Um, oh, I, yeah, I for sure. That, that hot coffee experiment, I'm, there's obviously thousands of them, but the idea, the one where uh, before you meet someone, someone mm-hmm. gives you hot coffee to hold on mm-hmm. to. Ooh, this is new. I haven't heard of this. Yeah, so uh, you're uh, someone's going to interrupt you and ask you a question, say hi to you, ask you for something, maybe ask mm-hmm. you to fill out a survey. But before they okay. do, uh, someone ten feet in front, it's almost like a setup. You don't even know it's mm-hmm. happening. They, they're like, oh, excuse me, can you hold this for a second? And they give you a cup of either mm-hmm. hot coffee or cold coffee, iced coffee. Okay. And the people that held the warm coffee. Um, noted that the person they talked to next more favorable than the, than the people that held the cold coffee. Ooh, weird. <laughs> it's like just, but it's those things where I'd be like, okay, I want to apply this. Like, how can I um, think yeah. I like, had a business meeting here, Sonia? Right, hold, right. You hold this for a second. So let's I talk about me coffee. now. Or like a job yeah. interview, you know, bring right. someone some hot coffee and have them hold on to it. But those kind of things are fun and interesting and obviously gets into behavioral sciences too. But yeah. observing, to your point, phenomena. That, are, that is happening and then mm-hmm. applying science. That's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, that's always what's been super, you know, compelling um, to be able to hook into, you know, something that might be like sort of a subcultural trend, but then suddenly becomes mainstream, you know? Um, you know, even when you look at growth experiments and testing and, you know, that started out as like a small subset of, you know, marketers who were doing that. Now everybody does that. Now everybody wants a piece of that pie. Um, and that's really where you see, you know, trends and phenomenology come into play, you know, like 10 years ago, you say to someone, are you doing any growth experiments? They really wouldn't know where to start or how to answer you. But nowadays you say that to someone and any marketer who's, you know, worth their street cred is going to actually tell you like, this is how we do it. And they're going to know that they need an answer for that question. And so that's the interesting part about like how things spread. I got one for you. Maybe you could put it under your lens. ABM, right? Ah, uh, yes. A lot of companies have known their targets for a long time and go after them. Hey, I, a certain number of schools, I go after a certain number of schools. But the idea of instead of boiling the ocean, you boil a little cup. It's been around, right. but there's some people that have carried the banner. But And maybe it's just the, the circles I hear where it's just an echo chamber and some right. maybe don't hear it. I don't know if that's the case, but... Could you break that down for me? Because it's definitely gotten bigger and more popular. There's apps about it now. People talk about it all the time. There's events, flip my funnel, that kind of thing. Oh, sure. I mean, the funny thing about ABM is I'm pretty sure that ABM is really just what we've been doing to sell and market for the past hundred years. You know, right. I think really the issue is not, is ABM effective? Uh, it, the issue is, you know, like how can we untrain ourselves to think that success means the most traffic, the most views, the most Ooh, shares, like the highest that, you know, I think the, the trouble is in that people believe that more is more. But with mm-hmm. ABM, you're saying, okay, more isn't necessarily more if it's not the right buyer, if it's not the right audience. Um, and so I think ABM just sort of like reigns us all in. Yeah. forces us to see, you know, who is actually getting value out of our product? Who wants a solution like our solution? Um, and I think that that's really what the heart of the matter is. I mean, ABM is how we've always, you know, marketed to people, sold to people, uh, by knowing, you know, who we're going after. Like you wouldn't write a letter to someone if you didn't know who you were addressing it to. ABM is that, and it's not a new concept, but it is a correcting concept, right? Because marketers have gone batshit crazy probably over the last five years, (laughs) putting everything under the sun to drive the most this and most that. When in reality, that subset of people who get tons of value out of your product are going to be the people that you want to go after and more just like them. So I think ABM is great. I also don't think it's new. <laughs> right. But, but the, the, would you call it a micro trend though? That it, I would say it's definitely yeah. out there. Yeah. You've, it's, got, you've got, you know, apps and ecosystem being created and absolutely. conferences. How does that even come about? I'm obviously asking Elon Musk to design a rocket for me, but from a sociological lens, how does something like that go from a little nugget to 
talking well, about it on the hardcore marketing show heard by millions the galaxy. heard by millions you know <laughs> the world um i think really people getting results people finding that it solves maybe the business challenge but it also <clears throat> alleviates some of the pain of, yeah. of trying to market to everyone and not really knowing where you know your special niche is um and i think that's really why it spreads people talk about avm and, and abs to a lesser extent and really what they're saying is, I want to talk to the people who are more likely to buy. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, so if you get enough people saying, I practice ABM and therefore I'm getting more of the right customers at the right time and more revenue, hell yeah, people are going to jump on board. Right. And in, in, in this case, it makes sense. It's almost like hearing something, you know, there's a guy named Dave Ramsey who gives financial mm -hmm. advice. It's nothing mind-blowing it's just do right. this first do this second or don't do that and you knew that anyways you didn't right. have to have him tell you that in a book or exactly like but it's sometimes it's the simple things just being told to you you're right i need to do that you're in like right. a framework yeah you're right it's not impressions what am i thinking i need to i need mm -hmm. to find out who i really want to go after or exactly. get more of the same it kind of reminds us to do that yeah um, totally yeah because because sometimes in it can have Things like that can have the, it can feel like, it, has anyone actually gotten results from, maybe not ABM, but you know, mm -hmm. sometimes these little micro trends get, right. are we at, is this a real thing or is this marketing, you know, gone yeah. astray? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I know a lot of yeah. people, at least with ABM, get results. But, you know, it's those kind of things you're always sort of wondering what's going on. Yeah, and I think like rightfully so, people have, have obviously seen results with it and they can, yeah. they can really tailor their marketing efforts around that concept. I think at the end of the day, people are looking for a simpler, more cost-effective way to market, and ABM yeah. really allows them to do that. Right, because instead of spending money on getting 10,000 people, you're focusing on that 300 or so. Yeah, that are like the perfect fit. Yeah, perfect fit for mm -hmm. you and for them. And it's Absolutely. Like, when, when did that, was there like a moment like angels singing in the sky when you were at oh. school and you're at you know, at the dining hall or mm -hmm. subway and you're doing your thing and it's all theory and you're like, you know what? None of this. To marketing. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think for me, um, as like a communicator, as someone yeah. who's always had a passion for words, you know, you can, you can take your, your passion and, and, and funnel that into a variety of different outcomes. You know, I, I could have decided that playwriting was great or screenwriting for me, I think the intersection of content and business was the most compelling intersection. Mm. Um, and that's really like, I've always been, you know, entrepreneurial. Um, yeah, I ran my own business for four years. That was the cultivated word. Oh, cool. um, and I think that that for me was like the turning point where I was like, oh, like I'm really passionate about content, but I also really like business and outcomes and yeah. being an entrepreneur. And I think when all of those things sort of, hit each other, uh, that's when the light bulb went off. Got it. So you were doing like the freelance work while at school? So yeah, when I was in college, I mean, when I was in college, I was experimenting with all different things. I had a blog. Um, uh, literally. When nobody, when, nobody, experimenting. when nobody had a blog, uh, <laughs> when I revealed well, my we're, age. But we're talking about marketing. Got it. Yeah, I know. So I, <laughs> I blog in my senior year of, of college. I answered, uh, have you heard of Haro, help a reporter out? Yeah, remember that. Yeah, I had Haro, I had PR Newswire. I would answer, you know, requests coming in for experts on style, which was what my blog was about. Nice. Um, so I come back as an expert, you know, I was in the LA Times. I was the style expert for the National Enquirer, believe it or not. Um, and really, you know, like that was like fascinating to me. I was like, yeah. why, like, how is this possible? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was just a fun experiment to be honest. Right. Right. That makes total sense. Yep. Absolutely. Well, cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, you know, I, there's one other story I wanted to get to, which was the, the grasshopper story. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, the video. famous grasshopper story. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that one is, I think, that's held like a special place in my heart because it was really like the first project that I did with my company that I started, The Cultivated Word. Um, but it also had the biggest impact on me professionally. Um, so I'd been working for a company that was in the process of, of rebranding um, from Got Vmail, which is a tough name, uh, to Grasshopper. And I'd been, you know, freelancing for them. And they came to me with this project. 
Um, they're like, we want to do a video for the rebrand. You know, can you help us out? Like, this is the kind of video that we want to do. It was animated, something called kinetic text. Um, and that turned out to be a, a pretty defining project for me. I had never done a video like that in my entire life. How did you land um, that opportunity? So I, I had been freelancing for them for a while. I had known both of the founders um, and, you know, in their early stages when they mm. needed this, you know, copy written or help with their website, oh, I would right. jump in and I would do that and parlayed that into this project um, that ended up being pivotal. Um, the video was called Entrepreneurs Can Change the World. And it sort of was a turning point because I, I used all my skills as a writer, like as a poet uh, to write the script, uh, you know, as a creative to imagine the vision for the story. And then, you know, just my project management skills to actually bring it to life. Um, and it ended up being this huge viral sensation because we decided we weren't going to tell people what this video was about in advance. We were just going to send them a box of chocolate covered grasshoppers with just a tag and the really? URL. Really? Like the actual video. chocolate grasshoppers? Actual chocolate grasshoppers. Have you tried them? Um, I did eat one during that period of time. I would not recommend it. Um, <laughs> just yeah. to be honest with you. Um, Keep the chocolate and, separate. Yeah. And so people didn't have an explanation for why they were receiving these chocolates. Sure. Mystery. So they, were, they were forced to go to the URL, which was a link to the YouTube video, Entrepreneurs Can Change the World. Uh, the video blew up. Like, I mean, I, it's had well over a million views at this point. Jeez. And at that point in time, it sort of kickstarted my business. Um, and so for the next few years, you know, people sought me out for that type of video, but I was able to also expand, you know, my content uh, creation services, my content strategy services, and start to make a name for myself. We started sending out all of these packages of chocolate covered grasshoppers to yeah. these unsuspecting uh, uh, recipients. The gross um, grasshoppers. <laughs> yeah, it was like people were, you know, obviously they were incredibly intrigued, right? Yeah. Um, and so they watched this video that, it was really just the story of, of entrepreneurship, um, sort of like how, how I saw it and, and how uh, the co-founders of Grasshopper saw it. Yeah. Um, and it connected with people, like to the point where, you know, I was getting feedback from people saying like, you know, it made me cry. Um, yeah. And I was like, really? Yeah. Oh my God. Like, wow. And um, I mean, I wasn't expecting that, but I was like really excited to see the, you know, the view count just like climb, like every day, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands uh, more and the momentum was insane. Um, and you know, like news outlets were, were covering it. Um, right. So it was like that first big taste of what it was like to have content that actually was mm. viral. And this was back in the day when you could legitimately have like organic viral content with 2009. Right. Um, but like, it's like and, your baby, your creation went. Yeah. Oh. And it, it was it was not like I wasn't expecting that level of uh, intrigue and, and, and popularity, but it, it struck a chord with people like yeah. on some level, the words, the music, um, the visuals, the story was compelling. Right. And so that, I that watch this thing. Great. What's it called? It's if called I entrepreneurs can change the world. Um, and so I, I kind of went all out on it, you know, so we produced like an original soundtrack for it with Carly commando um you know which was you know a, a piano piece you made people cry though that's like the ultimate act cry. of artistry i was like i was actually floored by it i didn't realize that people would connect in that way but you know when you think about creating content you know those are the types of authentic reactions that you want out of, of people, authentic, you know out of your audience but and so for me that was like a huge turning point um with that video i you know it was my first one i didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, I knew that I was going to get it done no matter what. Um, and the best thing I did was, you know, when I was talking to them, I was like, well, you know, can you put my, can you put my name in the first line of YouTube credits? Cause maybe it'll be good for business. Yeah. Maybe. Um, it turns out that might've been the best business decision that I ever made out in my early career. Wow. Um, things just started blowing up after that. And you know, you talk about inbound and no forms <laughs> and things like that the amount of inbound traffic and leads that I got was, you know, steady and growing for pretty much the lifetime of the cultivated word. And, you know, it, which was both good and bad, right? You know, I got to do all these projects that were very similar to that grasshopper piece and, you know, write stories and develop all these relationships with clients. Right. But after a certain point, I was like, well, I want to do, you know, I want to do something else. You know, sure. I want to, I want to do other types of content. I want to have different experiences 
Um, but that video, man, like that video yeah. was like the the foundation upon which I, I really built my content career. Had you already made the decision to not do school, not continue? Or were well, you still kind I had, of one toe in the water? Yeah, so I finished. I, I got my master's degree. I decided not to. Oh, I see. Got, yeah. yeah. Yeah, got yeah, that, but then yeah. not do the PhD. Yeah, I had Gone. already decided at that point. I think okay. there were there was far too like when I tell when I decide something, I am pretty good. I'm like, yep, not doing it. Um, and so nice. as soon as I you know I got my <laughs> master's degree, I was like, see ya, academia. Um, and for me, for me, that was the right choice. Yeah. I spent enough time in in school, and I I was very focused about it. Um, and so this was like the turning point that my business needed and so yeah. after that the cultivated word was a was a great source of learning uh both about how to run a business but then how to, to sell content like how do you talk about that with businesses because back then 2010 2011 yeah, it's fresh people didn't really know what content was like no. they were like content i mean they were familiar with journalism but the content movement hadn't really you know kicked into high gear interesting yeah wow. it was crazy crazy whirlwind and then all these people just flooding into your business please please work with me Good. big brands like a lot of big brands just knocking on your door saying can you repeat the same lightning bolt with my video yeah and well yeah a whole bunch of different like all different sorts of people sure. i think both for video and then getting to work with you know great people you know as far as like content creation and content strategy for yeah. their businesses that was great um, you know, I worked with large businesses like DHL and Netflix commissioned some version of that same type of video. Uh, you know, I, I think honestly, though, the most that I got out of it was really just like connecting with those people that were the next step in my career after that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it got me noticed by HubSpot. That's why I went to go work at HubSpot. Sure. Um, and HubSpot was really that period of time where content was getting so much momentum. Yeah. And um, then they're, and they're, you know, responsible for a lot of that. I mean, they, exactly. they that flag for sure. Yeah. And that was a, that was a big deal. Um, but I think, you know, the big message, the big takeaways for me with the cultivated word, um, it was really about relationships. You know, how do you mm. take risks that are good for your career, but don't necessarily feel like, I think too many people obsess over like, well, I've got to do something in this order so I can get to this, you know, this point in time. With um, career. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of like not the, the right way to look at it. You know, you have to take smart risks and do interesting things yeah. and worry about, worry about like titles and upward trajectories later. Cause like if, I mean, those things are usually pretty meaningless. Um, so if you want a, like an interesting career and one that makes you happy, I think you really have to go the path of like, what's the next interesting, you know, project or opportunity for me. Um, and for me, that was, you know, running my business at the time, then getting, you know, full tilt into content and product marketing. Um, so yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Those, those kind of things are fun when they happen, but they can't be your purpose, you know, your why right. you, it can't be to get that title or that next salary because you'll always be chasing something you'll always be comparing yourself to yep. some more or less so it's just it's kind of a empty circle you really need to find the thing that makes you happy and totally. and, and when you do that what's funny is then <laughs> life sort of rewards you because your work is that much better when you're passionate about it and yeah. that infuses everything and i think this this ties into we were chatting earlier that we we also share um a passion for mentorship and helping people mm -hmm. and, and yes. teaching the youngsters coming up the the young ones. how yeah. to approach things you know absolutely yeah i think that's actually been pretty motivating for me like sure. aside from creating compelling content and and working for companies that i really admire um for me i think the biggest thing has been you know how do i take all of those experiences and and pay it forward in some way right. um yeah. and for me that has been uh mentorship you know working with and talking to and building relationships with people who are coming up in marketing or sales um and they're kind of looking for advice about you know those trajectories those paths um i think that's been more gratifying than than any other aspect of of what i've done to be honest totally. yeah. um and being able to nurture those relationships and say like hey you don't have to 
play by this, you know, this, this playbook. You don't have to run these plays, these typical career plays. Right. Um, you know, you can actually do it another way and be just as successful. Yeah, it's not the medical field, right? It's not like you need to go do your, your residency and do this and do that. And it, marketing, you know, it's the best marketers, the best folks in our industry have some other weird thing that they did that infused them. Yeah. Andy went to China, you in sociology, and I know there's some other fun things. And, and, and you know, me, like Marine Corps, just it's all that exactly. experiences that probably helped us keep things real and authentic you know so it's like we bring that confidence over to marketing so we can be authentic be confident and yeah tell it how it is and share our 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 passion and people just like oh cool maybe i'll pay attention yeah Yeah. absolutely and i think you know for me like i think we mentioned this at some point when we were chatting um for me that like no bullshit mentality probably derives mainly from like my upbringing i grew up in the new york city area Um, (laughs) we're very yeah like i only roll out the accent at at special times oh you roll it out you got one sometimes i roll it out oh no later but um maybe when you're mad at people it just it comes out sometimes you just never know um it's unpredictable (laughs) and uh Anyway, that approach, that yeah. you know, that straightforward approach, has probably been um, a real guiding force for me. Um, and I, I find myself attracted to people who have that same mindset. Right. Who you know are you know not beating around the bush. You know, they want to get to the heart of the matter. Um, and I find that those people are so genuine and so um, you know. I hate to overuse this word because we've thrown it around a lot today, but authentic. Because at the end of the day, like you connect with those people so much more easily um, when you remove that facade, you remove that wall, um, and you just treat each other like a couple of humans. And um, I think that's what attracted me to Drift, um, because everyone there is like that. You know, the the leadership we have is all about that level of authenticity and transparency. Um, So yeah, I think that you kind of have to take all of these experiences and, and really own your own personal narrative um, and not, you know, try to play by, you know, someone else's rules in terms of like how to build your career, where to go with your career. How to write your blog post, be authentic. How to write your blog post. Yeah. You know, and we were talking earlier, repeating things can be a good thing. Just like the cliches are usually truth. You know, repetition, there's a great quote, Tony Robbins, repetition is the mother of skill. So mm-hmm authentic 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 and maybe if you heard it 80 times on this podcast you might have i don't know maybe one takeaway from this amazing conversation which is be freaking authentic yeah and then watch the results happen you know yeah like be yourself stop i mean people have said that for far too long it's incredibly trite i apologize for employing it particular context but the thing is no one can be you no one yeah. has, like has that you know, unique opportunity to take you know your experiences and leverage that for whatever outcome you know you want and and that's your secret that's the secret sauce right there totally totally well there's one other thing oh hello uh, oh yeah airpods just ran out of juice <laughs> oh well you know what this you know, we're just going to have to chat more because um, technology is saying it's time to call it a day but you know what we will get back together and yeah. there's so much more to talk about and obviously you know kindred spirits from authenticity standpoint marketing and uh thank you so much for coming on here it was my pleasure uh i apologize for the dropout of sound at the end but you know what i'm gonna be authentic about it and say yeah totally it was, uh, part of the plan. um and I, it was great chatting with you yeah, absolutely. And again, we'll, we'll have you back. Thank you so much for being on here. For everyone else listening, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, if you got a takeaway, like being authentic or any of the 80 other things, um, then share it with someone and, and, and help them out. You know, Give to someone else this, this information, this wisdom um, from Sonia. So, Sonia, thanks again. And everyone else li- listening, thanks again. This has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We'll catch you next time. Hey.